Whether you want to call the new 2022 Pathfinder an SUV or a crossover is between you and Nissan's marketing department. But any way you slice it, the Pathfinder has long been a very family-focused three-row vehicle. And for 2022, Nissan is doubling down on that with even more family-friendly features in this model. And they've also addressed some of the complaints that people had of the previous generation Pathfinder. Most notably, Nissan has deleted one of the most controversial drivetrain features of the Pathfinder, the CVT. You've probably already seen the Pathfinder before, so today I am out here in the frozen north of Montana. Montana, driving the Nissan Pathfinder to find out, is this the best three-row family vehicle in America, or should you take a look somewhere else? As you approach the Pathfinder, the first thing you're going to notice is the new design language. Nissan decided to make this much boxier, more aggressive, perhaps a bit more masculine than the previous generation Pathfinder. They've given it a certainly more horizontal hood and a taller front-end design. This follows a lot of the styling cues from the rest of the Nissan lineup, including the new Nissan Rogue, but Nissan decided not to make this look like simply a scale version of that smaller crossover. We have very similar full LED headlights, but in an interesting cost-saving twist, the turn signal remains incandescent even in this top end trim, but we have a distinctive LED accent strip up top. The strong chrome bar that we find in other Nissan models is present up front. We have LED fog lights below, and these are not actually skid plates. These are just painted sections of the bumper. As you walk around the Pathfinder, the boxier proportions are instantly obvious. Adding to the boxier design, they've actually made this a little bit shorter than the outgoing model, 197.7 inches long. That's nearly an inch shorter than the outgoing Pathfinder. They didn't change the structure of this vehicle really at all, so it's still a very family-friendly three-row crossover with a decently sized third row. Instead, what Nissan did was they just clipped some inches off of the front bumper and the rear bumper. That makes the Pathfinder appear a little bit more boxy, a little bit more modern, and actually a little bit more Land Rover-esque. Definitely a good thing to be reminded of when we're talking about a mainstream three-row crossover that is significantly less expensive than a Land Rover and likely considerably more reliable as well. The Pathfinder is going to be the only option in this segment to give you a two-tone paint option, basically a black roof like we see in this model. There are going to be five different paint colors that will offer this particular option, and the only part above this belt line that's body colored becomes this little section right here. Be sure to let me know what you think about the design down there in the comment section below. I am driving the top end trim with this two ton paint scheme and the 20 inch wheels. In case you've accidentally forgot what vehicle you purchased, you'll easily be reminded by this enormous Pathfinder text on the back of the hatch. This is about three feet wide. The hatch itself is a little over four feet wide because we now have a wider cargo area than we had before. Down at the bottom, we have a two inch hitch receiver and a seven pin wiring harness connector. Rear parking sensors are standard in every Pathfinder model, but like we see up front, these are combination tail lamp modules. So the brake lights are LEDs, but the turn signals and the backup lights are incandescent. Nissan bundles their active driver assistance technology a little bit differently than other manufacturers. Keep in mind that the Pathfinder is about $2,000 less starting than a Highlander. So we don't find radar adaptive cruise control on this model, but you will find it on comparably priced Pathfinders. The base model has forward collision warning with autonomous emergency braking, pedestrian and cyclist detection, rear parking sensors, and rear autonomous emergency braking. If you want features like adaptive cruise control and Nissan's advanced lane keeping system, you will have to pay extra for those. But by the time you've comparably equipped other vehicles in this category, they're going to be about the same price. Like the previous generation Pathfinder, under the hood we find a 3.5 liter V6 engine. This one produces 284 horsepower and 259 pound-feet of torque. But in a big departure from the previous model, this one no longer has a continuously variable automatic. Instead, it uses a ZF-sourced 9-speed automatic transmission. This is the new 9HP50, the second generation of that 9-speed automatic, but it is very closely related to the transmission that we find in the Honda Pilot. Thanks to the 9-speed automatic transmission, this has better towing performance and 0-60 to 60 performance than the outgoing model, while still giving you 22 to 23 miles per gallon, depending on the version of the Pathfinder you get. Now, you might be wondering, why did they choose to use a 9-speed automatic from ZF rather than another CVT, or perhaps a different transmission out on the market? The main reason is that this 9-speed automatic has an incredibly broad ratio spread, and that's exactly why Honda and Acura Chrysler, Stellantis, and a number of other companies, including Jaguar Land Rover, use basically the same 9-speed automatic transmission. Expressed as a number, the distance between the lowest ratio available and the highest ratio available in the CVT that this transmission replaces was 6.4. This transmission is 9.84. That means that not only do you have a lower first gear for better starts with a trailer or just better 0-60 to 60 performance, but you also have a higher final gear for better fuel economy out on the open highway. And this transmission is just better suited to towing generally than a CVT. If you're on a slope and you have a trailer connected to the vehicle, you will certainly notice the difference between the previous Pathfinder and this model. Also something like the Subaru Ascent, which has the same problem with its CVT in terms of starting ratio as the previous generation Pathfinder did. 
At this point, some of you might be screaming into your screen, but Nissan calls it four-wheel drive, and it has a 4WD logo right back here on the hatch. Honestly, four-wheel drive versus all-wheel drive, it's a marketing distinction without a difference. Manufacturers will in fact call the exact same system four-wheel drive in one vehicle and all-wheel drive in another. While some people would like to pigeonhole systems by saying that four-wheel drive systems are two-speed transfer case-based systems, the reality is that's not always been the definition. So again, Distinction without a difference, call it whatever you want. Although I haven't spent as much time in the Pathfinder as I'd like today, I rank front seat comfort excellent in this top end platinum trim. We have a multi-way adjustable driver's seat. It does, however, have a two-way lumbar, not a four-way lumbar support. I am a little bit disappointed by that we have a powered tilt telescopic steering column that is memory linked to the two position driver memory. Bearing in mind that the Pathfinder is less expensive than some of the comparable options, we don't have a passenger seat with the same range of motion as the driver's seat. It's a four way power seat in this model. The Pathfinder is available as a seven passenger or an eight passenger vehicle. The base model is gonna be an eight passenger. The top end platinum trim is seven passenger only. The other trims, it depends on the option packages that you select. The way that Nissan has bundled things, if you want certain features like this panoramic moonroof, it appears that you have to get the seven passenger version. This is a captain's chair design with a removable center console. I have to say I'm a little surprised that instead of this removable center console, Nissan didn't give us a removable middle seat like we find in the Acura MDX. That would have been a really handy feature. But if you do like the idea of captain's chairs, but you want to be able to walk back there to the third row a little bit more easily, this is going to be a good option to get. Now, why might you want to remove this center console for that particular feature? We do have the ability to tilt and slide these second row seats forward while a child seat is latch anchored into place. This is a feature that Nissan originally pioneered with the last generation Pathfinder, and you can do it in all three seating positions across the second row. But most importantly, you cannot do that with a forward facing child seat in place because it would be bopping the seat right here. It wouldn't give you much motion. And you can't do it if you have a child seat that has exceeded the latch anchor weight range. The door cup holders are nice and deep in this model, but something important to keep in mind is that if you have a regular takeout drink in there and then you just slam the door, the drink could end up on the seats. Hopping into the third row is pretty easy with that tilt and slide mechanism. You can also fold the second row seats flat like that so you can bring cargo on from the second row. There's an electric release button on the back of the seat back so I can press it right back there if I'm in the third row to tilt and slide that seat forward. And according to Nissan, this seat will not move in that way if there is about 10 pounds of child in the average child seat. So if you're worried about that, keep that in mind. However, it is still possible to push that button and then push the seat forward. So definitely keep an eye on your kids. Based on the spec sheet that Nissan sent out, it appears that the third row has shrunk a little bit over the previous generation. Combined legroom in this model seems to come in just over 107 inches. But that number appears to be wrong, and I've asked Nissan for clarification on that. That's why there's an asterisk up there. Because with this second row seat, very comfortably adjusted for me at six feet tall, that front row seat all the way back in its tracks, I still have about an inch and a half of legroom. So I suspect that this is actually about the same as the outgoing Pathfinder when it comes to legroom. And thanks to the boxier profile and higher roof line than the previous generation, this third row seat is also much more comfortable. This seat is in a pretty upright position. I still have about an inch of headroom left. Now these rear seats do recline. There's a little lever right back there so I can put it in its most reclined mode. Now if I do that, my head does touch the ceiling, but just barely. This is a much more comfortable third row than the one in the Highlander or in the Pilot. But of course, this is still a relatively small third row, even though this is wider across the wheel wells than the Highlander and Pilot, and therefore certainly more comfortable for adults. I don't know if I would want to squeeze three adults back here for too long, but it could be done because of the width of this third row seat. There's just about enough width that my rear end is on either side of the seat belt anchors. So clearly there's going to be a little bit of hip rubbing if you put three of me back here. But again, because of the width, it's certainly something that I'd be able to do. Back here, we have four additional cup holders and USB charge ports, along with air vents for the third row passengers. But on the downside, as you can see right here, the center seat belt does come out of the ceiling, not out of the seat back itself. Of course, the reality is that most folks are going to keep the third row folded most of the time. You do have to separately fold the headrests in the third row with these little fabric tethers. There's no power third row in the Pathfinder, but personally, I don't find that a problem because this is a really light and easy to move third row, and it's going to be considerably faster than any of those power options. The third row seat features top tether anchors for all three seating positions, but only one additional set of latch anchors on the driver's side. Behind the power hatch, we find 16.6 cubic feet of storage space. According to Nissan, you can put six 22 inch roller bags back here. I suspect in my 24 inch roller bag test, I might be able to squeeze three back here. One interesting thing to note is that this cargo area between the wheel wells is now 48 inches wide, just actually a little bit over. So you can put four by sheet things 
into the Pathfinder. That's something that we can't do in the vast majority of three-row crossovers, outside of course minivans if you want to call those a crossover. I'm really happy that Nissan decided to blur the lines between the average American minivan and the average three-row crossover, because that seriously improves the practicality of this. If you have kids that are into art supplies or you're doing some DIY at home, you can fit those four by eight sheets of things in the vehicle with them hanging out the tailgate just a little bit. But that's not something you can do in a Toyota Highlander. You'd have to get a Toyota Sienna for that. Nissan has really stepped up their interior design game, and it's really obvious in the Pathfinder and the new Nissan Rogue. One of the interesting touches that we find in the Pathfinder is not necessarily this panoramic roof itself, but the price point at which it's available. It's definitely a few thousand dollars less than most of the alternatives. The second and third row feature fixed height shoulder belts. There's a better view of that window shade right there. Up front, we have height adjustable shoulder belts and two-way adjustable headrests. Leather upholstery also happens at a lower price than most of the competition. This seat is heated and ventilated. That's why we have those perforations in the middle. And it has a very attractive two-tone design with that charcoal stripe right there on the back cushion and on the bottom cushion. The bolstering isn't terribly aggressive, so larger drivers and passengers shouldn't have too much of a problem in these seats. And I do find the general design quite comfortable. It's something that we've seen out of Nissan for a while. Moving over to the front doors, we have a high percentage of soft touch materials, some stitched upper sections, soft touch midsection of the door, and harder plastics, as you'd expect, down there around the bottom of the door. The bottle holder has a divider in it, making it a little bit more useful, and then we get some imitation metallic accent trim right there around the door handle. On the passenger side dashboard, we have a storage cubby with a rubber lining, so you can store smartphones, keys, wallets, sunglasses, that sort of thing in there. We have a stitched upper section of the dashboard, definitely dressing things up in this model. More of that imitation metallic accent trim right around that air vent. We then have a medium-sized bin-style glove compartment. I'm not sure I'd be able to fit a 10-inch tablet in there. Depending on the trim you get, you will find either an 8-inch or a 9-inch color touchscreen LCD in the middle of the dashboard. They run essentially the same software, but the big difference with the 9-inch screen is that this has wireless Apple CarPlay. That's why you see the little charge icon right over there. Aside from that, the systems are running essentially the same software package. We've seen the same software in other Nissan vehicles. It has a pretty typical home screen right there with CarPlay information being pulled from your smartphone. There's a factory mapping interface available as well. And if you use the factory mapping system, you will get a moving map display in the LCD instrument cluster that is optional, as well as turn-by-turn -turn directions in the optional heads-up display. We also have a 360-degree camera system. This is one of Nissan's latest systems with moving object detection and a pretty crisp image of the system around. This is one of Nissan's latest systems with moving object detection, that's what MOD stands for, and a pretty crisp readout. Below the LCD, we find two large air vents, the engine start stop button right there, the controls for the standard three zone automatic climate control system. I appreciate the fact that that is standard. And then the optional heated seats and ventilated front seats right over there. Below that, we have two USB inputs, a USB-C and a regular USB. They're a little hard to see here. And a Qi wireless charging mat. It is angled and it has a little rubber bumper there so that way your phone stays right in position. There's also a little slot here where I suppose you could keep a smartphone in a more upright position if you wanted to. We then have two pretty decently sized cup holders behind that and the same sort of joystick style shifter that we see in other Nissan vehicles. There's a lock unlock button right over here on this side, or I should say unlock button. We then pull down for drive, pull again for the manual mode, push forward for reverse, and then park is that P button on top. There's an electric parking brake, auto brake hold, and a button to disable the auto start stop system. This does have auto start stop for 2022. Here we have Nissan's latest terrain management knob. There are a bunch of different drive modes based on your situation. This has a slightly different all-wheel drive system than the previous version that's more predictive in its nature and more aggressive at locking up the center coupling. But we don't have a button to simply engage the center coupling. Instead, we just have these drive modes which does it for you based on the predictive nature of the system. Between the front seats, we find a padded center armrest with the Pathfinder logo up front. Behind this padded area, we find the controls for the Tri-Zone Automatic Climate Control System. I do prefer the controls in this location versus in the ceiling, but keep in mind if you do have someone in the center seat, especially a child, they might end up kicking it. This opens to reveal a fairly large storage compartment, but oddly enough, we don't have any power ports inside. No USB ports and no 12-volt charge port. Since I'm driving the top end platinum trim, we have a full LCD instrument cluster on the driver's side. This is just over 12 inches. And as you can see, it actually has a moving map display right there in the middle. It offers two basic view designs. So I can hit this change meter button right there. And I can get a wider map. This is, to my knowledge, the only option in the segment that actually gives you this moving map display. I'm sure if I get that wrong, everybody will let me know in the comment section. But this display is certainly more configurable than the one that we find in the Palisade. There are a number of different views. It'll pull album art and information from the media source. We get active safety readouts right there in the middle, status of the vehicle start-stop system, turn-by-turn -turn navigation directions, and the moving map display that's only active when factory navigation is active, however, otherwise we get this compass rose right here, and then a screen that just gives you car plate or other media information. 
The steer wheel is one of Nissan's attractive flat bottom designs. It has really thin side spokes and a split bottom spoke. There are paddle shifters on the back, up on the right, and then down on the left. Remember, this does not have a CVT anymore, so this is actually controlling real gear ratios. On the right side of the wheel, we have the controls for the adaptive cruise control and pro pilot system. You can turn the system on and off with this button right here. On this side, we have infotainment controls, and then this button, this button right here, and this little scrolly toggle, those control that multifunction instrument cluster. And in case you're wondering, yes, this model also has the available heads-up display. It's pretty crisp in person, although it is pretty tricky to film, especially when you're on a white background. As we get out on the trail, keep in mind that I'm not driving this Pathfinder at home. Home doesn't look quite like this, although I have a similar number of trees. Instead, I'm driving this at over 4,000 feet of elevation in Montana. So obviously my preliminary zero to 60 numbers are not going to be accurate. It's also pretty wet out there and it is 32 degrees. So keep all of that in mind. This vehicle went zero to 60 in my preliminary testing in 7.4 seconds. That puts this really, really close to the majority of the competition, whether we're talking about a Palisade, a Telluride, a Pilot, or a Highlander, etc. I would not be surprised if that dropped down to around 7.1 to 7.2 seconds by the time I got this at home, because my testing is done really, really close to sea level, just about 100 feet or so. My 60 to zero stopping distance in this model was 130 feet, but keep in mind, again, it is really wet out here. So that's actually a very good stopping distance for temperatures this low on all season tires and on a really wet and slick road surface. It's actually been snowing overnight. There's still a little bit of sleet and snow on the road. Unfortunately, due to the weather out here, the owner of the off-road course that we had been meant to go on has actually decided to close the course. So I haven't been able to test that sort of thing in the Pathfinder, but it's really obvious that this all wheel drive system is more predictive in nature than the previous generation. That's really obvious if I come to a complete stop and just floor it, we don't get that same kind of front wheel slip and then rear wheel engagement that we found in the previous generation Pathfinder. This system is gonna send an awful lot more torque to the rear pretty instantly. Now we do have hill descent control and I can also turn off the traction control although that last option is buried a little bit deeper than I would like in the LCD instrument cluster. Now, in this setting, you can really tell the difference between that and the previous generation because we don't get any power cutting and we have a really aggressive first gear ratio. So all four wheels end up spinning a little bit out on a slicker road surface like this. This definitely has a more sure-footed feel than the vast majority of the competition, but there are some key exceptions. The Korean models and the Toyota Highlander have pretty aggressive engagement of their center coupling, as does the Honda Pilot. And if you get certain versions of the Highlander in all versions of the all-wheel drive pilot, then they actually have a limited slip functionality mechanically on the rear axle because they have a torque vectoring axle in the rear, and that's not something we find in the Pathfinder. But honestly, this feels better out on slicker road surfaces than the Subaru Ascent because the Subaru system is not gonna be as aggressive at sending power to the rear. The other thing you'll really notice out on the road is the new nine-speed automatic transmission. This has a much more traditional transmission feel to it than the CVT that the previous generation Pathfinder had on it. And you'll really notice that if you start engaging the paddle shifters. The shifts are a little bit slow compared to some of the automatics, most notably the Highlander's automatic or the new 10-speed that we find in other Honda vehicles, but importantly, not the Pilot. That seems to just be due to the design of this ZF nine-speed automatic transmission. And keep in mind that there are going to be some shifts in this transmission that feel a little bit unusual just due to the general design of this 9HP automatic. If you want to know more about this transmission, I have a complete video on that where I take a really deep dive into the way this transmission functions and why it feels the way that it does. Even though this is the second generation of the ZF 9-speed automatic transmission, the fundamentals of operation remain the same as the 9-speed that we find in the Honda Pilot, the Range Rover Evoque, the Land Rover Discovery, and the Chrysler Pacifica. Although some people give this transmission a bit of a hard time, I think that most people will be just fine with it. The shifts are crisp, they're fairly quick when upshifting as if you're accelerating right like this. And once you're out on the open highway, it results in really good fuel economy because by the time this transmission has, if I can do this manual mode here and actually get it up here into ninth gear, at 70 miles an hour, the engine is loafing around under 2000 RPM. So that's how this gets to that high fuel economy. In real world driving, I wouldn't be surprised if this was a little bit higher than those EPA numbers. And you will notice that if you live in a state with higher speed limits, say Texas, where you can go over 80 miles an hour in some areas, this transmission is gonna have a really positive effect on fuel economy. But on the other hand, if you are out here driving around in ninth gear, say we're at 60 miles an hour and we needed to pass someone, if I floor it, it takes a bit for the transmission to shift. That's just due to the general design. However, this is quite simply one of the best software packages that's ever been applied to this transmission. I would say this is definitely the equal of the latest software that we see from the Stellantis group on their vehicles that use their nine speed automatic transmission. This is certainly better than the programming that we find in the Honda Pilot. And the big difference is in passing performance again. I'm now back in ninth gear if I floor it, 
now we're in the lower gear and we can pass. It's that moment of what feels like the transmission is in neutral that some people find disconcerting. That's just due to the design. Nothing is wrong with the transmission and I think it's actually just a fine compromise for getting the fuel economy and the performance that this transmission gets you. I haven't been able to spend much time out on winding roads today that aren't gravel. Most of my time on paved surfaces have been on pretty long highway runs like this, but I have to say that Nissan has definitely improved the steering feel in the Pathfinder and the handling feel as well. The suspension is better sorted and it is firmer than the previous Pathfinder. So if you thought the Pathfinder before was a little bit too soft, a little bit too wallowy, they've certainly tightened things up with this generation. But on the other hand, they haven't made this overly firm, so this is still just fine for longer road trips. And again, I think the front seats are very, very comfortable. It's a little bit too early to predict cabin noise scores because I'm not on my typical testing surface, but if I go over here to the rumble strip on the side, we actually get pretty decent control of road noise coming into the cabin, even though the Pathfinder has relatively wide tires. Wind noise is especially well controlled, so I wouldn't be surprised if this ended up being one of the quieter options in the segment. You'll especially notice that up front where we have an acoustic laminated windshield and acoustic laminated side glass. Thanks to the 9-speed automatic transmission and likely the direct injection system on this engine as well, out on longer highway stretches like this, the speed limit is 70 miles an hour. I've been averaging over 31 miles per gallon, and that's because even at 70 to 75 miles an hour, Hour, the engine is still spinning under 2,000 RPM, and that really helps improve highway fuel economy. In the city, obviously your fuel economy is going to be lower, and that will really depend on whether or not you use the auto start-stop system, what your number finally ends up being. And if you live in a hotter climate, keep in mind that auto start-stop system is not going to be a huge benefit to you, because in order to keep the air conditioning on and keep the cabin cool, it's going to have to start the engine. For the moment, bottom lining the Pathfinder on the road is pretty easy. 0-60 to 60 performance is pretty comparable to the competition. Braking performance is likely going to be similar as well. Handling has definitely taken a step forwards versus the previous Pathfinder, and although the ride quality is a little bit lower, they haven't really sacrificed too much to give this a more engaging and more direct feel. I appreciate the fact that Nissan didn't just make the suspension firmer, they also decided to focus on suspension refinement. So when you do find a section of road that curves a little bit more than the sections that I've been on before, this has a really sorted, really stable, really confident feel to it. It also has a nice, comfortable, luxurious, quiet cabin, which is another thing that I really like. Some folks may still question Nissan's decision to use the ZF9 speed automatic transmission. Again, downshifts are a little bit slower than some of the competition, but I really don't think that's a big deal. And I love the fact that this has that enormous ratio spread so we can get good trailering performance and also again over 30 miles per gallon without too much trouble on level interstate travel. Interestingly enough, the Pathfinder has one of the higher tow ratings available in this segment. High tow rating is not simply a function of engine power and transmission design. It's also a fact of the vehicle's suspension design, its payload capacity, and just the general design of the vehicle. Actual tow rating did not increase over the previous generation Pathfinder. That was also rated for 6,000 pounds. But the way this feels with the trailer attached is definitely different. The lower and more aggressive starting ratio certainly makes this feel peppier off the line with a trailer like this attached to the back. This is an Airstream trailer. It doesn't weigh exactly 6,000 pounds. It is less than that, but it is still about the same size that some folks might want to tow. It's worth noting that the tow rating on the Pathfinder is based on the latest SAE test procedure, and that test procedure allows much larger frontal areas than the standard that was used for some of the competitive crossovers out there that are rated for lower towing capacities. So with this vehicle, it is designed to be able to tow bigger and larger profile trailers like the one that's behind me. You'll really notice the difference with this 9-speed automatic transmission and the better application of power when you get out on the open highway like this and you're trying to accelerate with the trailer connected to the vehicle. This has a much more confident feel than the previous generation of the Pathfinder. This transmission has a lower starting ratio, so it's going to give you more torque to the wheels than the previous generation, as well as some of the competition. This tow rating is also a little bit higher than we find in the Ford Explorer, which is a little surprising since the Explorer is rear wheel drive. And even though the Explorer uses the same engine and transmission that we find in some of Ford's trucks, it, the rest of the vehicle just wasn't designed for this kind of curb weight. 6,000 pounds puts the tow rating of this vehicle above the rear-wheel drive Ford Explorer. Remember that the Explorer, even though it does have an engine and transmission barred out of one of Ford's pickup trucks, it doesn't have the same general design made for heavier towing. And that's because not too many people in mid-sized crossovers like this actually end up towing more than 5,000 pounds. If you are, however, interested in doing that, this is one of the few options. The only other real option out there in this price category is going to be the Dodge Durango.
If you want to get your hands on a Pathfinder, you can head over to the Nissan dealer now. They are currently in production and should start rolling onto dealer lots right around the same time that you're watching this video. The base model will set you back $33,410. All-wheel drive is a $1,900 option. If you want the SV trim, which gives you features like the Pro Pilot Assist System and the optional panoramic roof, that'll be $36,200. And generally speaking, due to Nissan's average discount rate, that model is probably going to be about the same price as a base Toyota Highlander once you've actually gotten out the door. The SL trim for $39,590 is going to be the model that will give you the 9-inch LCD infotainment system, the 360-degree camera system with the camera right there under the Nissan logo, and wireless Apple CarPlay. If you want the Platinum option, that's the one that I've been driving today. That is $46,190 for the front-wheel drive model. That's going to get you the heads-up display, the 12.3-inch LCD the instrument cluster and all the features that you've seen on this vehicle. For my detailed pricing and comparison section, you will have to wait until I can get my hands on the Pathfinder back at home, run it through my usual battery of tests, and of course, do all those detailed comparisons. I have not been able to drive this out on the same roads that I drive every other vehicle that I test here at Alex and Autos, so some details are a little bit difficult to talk about. But without a doubt, the new Pathfinder is much more dynamic than the previous generation, and it's also a screaming deal. If you want features like leather upholstery, a 360-degree camera, a panoramic roof, wireless Apple CarPlay, you're going to find those features on this for thousands of dollars less than most of the competition. And surprisingly, this is even still a really good deal feature for feature compared against some of the newer and more aggressively priced options in this segment like the Kia Telluride and the Hyundai Palisade. Now on the inside, this is not as big as the Telluride and Palisade. The Telluride has 21 cubic feet of cargo space, significantly more than we find in this model, and it definitely has more legroom than we find in the Pathfinder but it's going to be more expensive. I also think that Nissan has done an excellent job designing this Pathfinder. It's much better looking than the outgoing model, even though it is still very obviously a Nissan. They've done a great job of adapting the Nissan design cues, like this chrome U-shape right here, the Nissan headlights, etc., into a boxier, and honestly, again, a little bit more Land Rover-like form. And at the same time, Nissan has done a good job retaining the family-friendly features that Nissan shoppers have loved while adding on to them, like adding sensors for the keyless entry system to the rear doors, having rear doors that open really wide, these second row seats that flip and fold forward while a child seat is latch anchored into place, making getting into the third row considerably easier than a Highlander Pilot or Kia Telluride. One thing that I've found odd in this segment is that even family-focused vehicles like the Telluride and Palisade don't have this kind of feature. In fact, if you want a three-row crossover that is this kind of child seat practical, you're really limited to this, the Volkswagen Atlas, and the Mazda CX-9. And the CX-9 will only do it on one side of the second row. This will do it all across the second row, whether you're getting the captain's chairs or the three-person bench. The one caveat for this particular seat design is that your child and your child seat have to be weight appropriate for latch anchor use. There is an upper weight limit for that, so if you exceed that, you're going to have to use a shoulder belt, and then this function won't work. Bottom line, the Pathfinder is a well-rounded and definitely handsome three-row crossover. If you're looking for one of the best-looking, family-friendly three-row vehicles in this segment, you should certainly be putting the Nissan Pathfinder on your shopping list. And the price tag is pretty easy to accept. Most models are going to be between thirty-six dollars and about $42,000, and most of those vehicles will give you far more feature content than you'll find in the competition for a very similar price. Also, keep in mind, Nissan tends to have better financing deals and just a little bit more cash on the hood than most of the competition. Be sure and hit that subscribe button down at the bottom of your screen so you can be updated on all of the latest videos, including a full review of this just as soon as I possibly can. And of course, that video will be shot in an area with a little bit better lighting, not the fog that we have going on here, and certainly not in 29 degree weather. I'll see all of you later.